At B. Marcello on Twitter is where you find Brandon. At B. Marcello, 24-7 Sports. He's with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. What's happening, Brandon? How are you today? Doing well, guys. I, I've, um, I've lotioned up. Man, be on the desert. My my <laughs> head would look like a lizard. It was bad. Get that dry skin, huh? Um, so what was your takeaway from there? We talked to Brock Heward uh, the other day. He was on with us, what, Friday? And Brock seemed, I, I, I mean, noncommittal about the healthy future of the Pac-12 based on those meetings. You would say what to that? Yeah, about the same. I'll, I'll say this, uh, through our reporting there all week and what we published Friday, these next two months are going to be uh, incredibly interesting. We're not done yet, and the Big 12 is simply waiting in the shadows, waiting to hear exactly what the Pac-12 is going to be getting in this television deal. And uh, the word is, is if it's anything less than what the Big 12 received, which was about an average of 31 point, I think six or $31.7 million per team. People in the Big 12 feel confident that they're going to be able to swoop in and maybe get a few teams uh, from the Pac-12. They are very much interested in expansion and doing so. And they continue to have conversations through unofficial channels with some of these schools and Everybody's just in a holding pattern waiting to hear what the Pac-12 can deliver or, or what seems to be, as this goes along further and further down the road, what they can't deliver. Just from a fan in, in a television programming, because of time zones, it does seem like no matter what the quality of football is, having or basketball, but having the Pac-12 to all sign on to play late window East Central time games would benefit either ESPN or Fox. So why do you think there is a holdup on wanting to pay for some late night programming? Because as a fan, I love having another set of games after those great primetime games. Yes, yeah, certainly. But there's only so many windows in those late games and the Pac-12 has much more product to, to encompass the entire day. You've seen what the Big Ten's been able to do where they've got – major games on the major networks from morning to night now going into next season and beyond the pac 12 does not want to be a conference that's just we're the 9 30 game we're the 10 o'clock game and we have two games you maybe pay attention to every saturday they're wanting to spread things out as well also consider that what we're seeing in the media landscape here especially since the turn of the year with all the layoffs at disney and espn they also are being much more mindful of what exactly they are interested in purchasing as far as media rights. They've got the NBA coming up. There's rumblings out there about WWE and UFC and its deals with ESPN, but also on the WWE side mainly with NBC slash Peacock. That's expiring here soon. And the question is, is NBC interested in keeping those on board or are they maybe looking at getting more involved in the college football space as well? That's something that the Pac-12 has been looking into. Um, but not the money, the money's always there, but it's not as deep of a pool as it was, say, when the Big 12 was able to go in and get its deal done back in what, October, or November. The Pac-12 in a lot of ways has been paddling in water and it's been taking on water that entire time. And the longer they wait out there, uh, the, the less likely they're going to get a deal that's anywhere close to what, you know, George Kalafkoff, the commissioner there, was wanting when he opened up, opened this all up last July. We we're going on nearly a year of these discussions and not a lot of commitment, uh, at least publicly, and or I should say that publicly, but leaking out there from all these other television partners. It seems like that we entered a space there from February to early April, where every couple of weeks it was something new, like, oh, Ion TV's involved. The CW is involved. And then the last week or two, it's been, well, maybe NBC Universal is interested in everything. The fact that all these, and then of course, last week, the report coming out that that ESPN is not interested in tier one rights. And then myself and others reported almost immediately that that's not the case. ESPN still talking to them about tier one rights. The fact that the, all this is coming out and things change, it, 
it shows you that the Pac-12 is very much on uneven ground, shaky ground, and there is reason to be concerned that the Pac-12 will not have its full membership here in a couple of years. And Brandon, ironically, on the field, this could be one of the better years in the Pac-12. I think there's four teams legitimately that have a shot of winning that conference and getting to a college football playoff in USC, Washington, Utah, and Oregon. So it, it is interesting that on the field, the product seems to be getting better. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is the best the Pac-12 has looked, certainly in the college football playoff era. And they have by far got the best group of quarterbacks in all of college football. You look up and down that league. I mean, even the guys you're not talking about, uh, they're good. But the, the amount of star power in that conference at the skill positions is somewhat overwhelming. And I think people finally last season with the rise of USC started looking out there and going, oh, there's a lot of great players out here. And there's been a lot of great players that have transferred into the Pac-12, especially at quarterback and Bo Nix being one of them at Oregon at quarterback. So there are a lot of great and fantastic players out there. And listen, they, they might have like two of the top five Heisman Trophy contenders, including last year's Heisman winner and Caleb Williams. The Pac-12 needs to capitalize on this. And in a lot of ways, I'm sure if you put some truth serum in the administrators there, they wish that all these negotiations and television stuff and expansion wasn't happening until, say, a year from now, because I think that the things would be in a much better place for them uh, as far as with the negotiating power. Though, again, it's very difficult to project what uh, what's going to be going on just with the financials and, and the books for all these television partners, because they're 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 really tightening the belts all across the board right now. Brandon Marcello is with us 24 seven sports at B Marcello on Twitter. Follow him on all social media. Check out uh, his videos and all of that support all his work there. 24 seven sports. He's on the Johnston RV center.com hotline, a two part question. Um, both the teams in this state have added a transfer portal quarterback, your opinion of both teams after the addition of Peyton Thorne at Auburn and uh, Tyler Buckner in Tuscaloosa. How did that change for better or worse? Your opinion of both Auburn and Alabama. I think it improves Auburn just because they've got such a higher ceiling, so to speak, that they got to reach, be able to reach. And they were pretty bad at quarterback, let's face it. I mean, Robbie Ashford, I like the kid, but lowest completion percentage among all returning starters in the, in the SEC last year. Alabama, I honestly think that's a situation where they're just adding competition with Buckner. I think that they you go into that, I, I still like – Jalen Milrow in that competition going into August and Alabama is set pretty much everywhere else across the field there. Their offensive line, I think is going to be one of the better ones in all of college football. Um, but Auburn to me was one that could get an immediate upgrade in the win total just by going out and getting the right quarterback. I've seen Peyton Thorne, uh, obviously on TV, but also in person, I've talked to him. I've talked to his family, uh, in the past, the thing that concerns me about Peyton Thorne is like last year at Michigan State, you saw what it was like for him without Kenneth Walker III in the backfield. There's a lot more pressure on him, not only with the pass rush, but also in being able to deliver in the passing game. And he struggled at times. He was inconsistent. Um, how does he deal, one, with a new offense, but also one where he goes into Auburn where a lot of new pieces – um, and you got to figure out the receiver situation. And they just got a great kid from Ohio State. I think Auburn is just they've, – they've been upgrading the roster. I just think that it's easy to get pumped up about that and think, well, that means maybe they can contend for nine wins. No, the depth is not there still for Auburn to maybe be a nine-win team. But, you know, never discount Hugh Freeze. You guys remember the first year he went into Ole Miss. They are on that huge SEC losing streak. We're all wondering if they could just win maybe four games. And Hugh Freeze was even kind of saying that. He ends up taking them to a bowl game and in doing so in an impressive fashion with that offense. You know, uh, but I'm not sure Peyton Thorne is a dynamic passer. He's going to do things outside of kind of what you draw on paper for him, so to speak. I, I, he's not that type of quarterback. Are you, are you a little surprised that you haven't seen a quarterback leave Alabama or leave Texas or leave Georgia in this whole portal process? 
I, I think, you know, from the Georgia perspective, you do wonder about Brock Vandergriff if the SEC window hadn't closed February 1st. If he was able to transfer within the SEC without penalty, maybe he would have entered. I, I don't know. The one that does surprise me is at Texas with Malik Murphy. Um, I mean, listen, the guy's a great talent. And then we saw it in the spring game, and you heard all the great reports even going into the spring game. He's someone that could have immediately upgraded several rosters in the SEC. And I am particularly looking at Auburn. I, I think that if he had entered the portal, Auburn and him would have been a great fit and one that I think could have happened pretty quickly if Malik Murphy had entered the portal, but that didn't, that didn't happen. Um, and then you talk about Alabama. It's not surprising to me because I think you can sell to them one here at Alabama. You're going to contend for a national championship and look through our history here. You could potentially end up being the starter, even if you're not the starter because of injury or other situations. And at some point, you're going to get your shot to be the starter. You're going to get that opportunity. Um, but I do think that for a lot of these guys, uh, particularly in the SEC, that SEC window closing February 1st where you can't transfer between schools in the conference, I, I think that affected some decisions. Uh, last year was a disaster for Jimbo Fisher in Texas A&M. They lost six consecutive games. Um, Connor Wegman, though, watching him in spots, he looked like he could be a guy – they could maybe be the best quarterback they've had since Kellen Mond. Where are you on Texas A&M coming into this season? I'm high on them just because of the talent. I'm not, I'm not sure that they quite have the depth built up because, one, they've lost a lot of guys in transfer portal. This past offseason, I think they lost eight of those 22 players they signed in that number one recruiting class uh, two years ago, a year ago now. And – that hurts depth. Everybody was like, oh, well, those aren't starters. Those weren't going to like, yeah, but that's depth that you need in the SEC in week eight, week nine to be able to continue winning. I think that A&M should be a team this year that wins nine games. A&M is in a position very similar to LSU last year where they've got the talent still, but maybe not necessarily the depth to contend and maybe be that second team in the SEC West. And to get there, you got to have some luck with the injury concerns, but also you got to have really great coaching, consistent coaching. Brian Kelly provided that to LSU. LSU was just hemorrhaged going into the Brian Kelly era because of all the players that entered the transfer portal. And we forget that because their portal entries didn't happen when Brian Kelly got there. They were happening way back in October when everything was cleared up about Ed Orgeron's future and he decided to resign. Players were flooding into the transfer portal, but Kelly got in there, stabilized it, brought in a really strong portal class, and then great coaching that year, got them better week to week to week to week. Is Jimbo Fisher that type of guy? Is he someone that could level things out and keep everybody down and keep them focused on everything? Last year, he did not. You mentioned the losing streak. It just seemed like week to week, they weren't necessarily getting better, but it just seemed like it was more chaotic. They've got the coaches, the pedigree, Bobby Petrino should upgrade that offense immediately. You mentioned Connor, a quarterback who I'm really high on. That's a team right now that should win eight or nine games. Anything less than eight wins this year, to me, is not just a disappointment, a massive disappointment. And at that point, if that happens, I think there will be very real conversations happening in College Station about Jimbo Fisher's future. And as we know, because we all uh, graduated fifth grade math, Texas A&M can't win eight or nine. Auburn can't win eight and nine. Uh, Mississippi State can't win eight or nine. Ole Miss can't win eight or nine. Alabama can't win. You know, I'll have faith. LSU, the way. And everybody can't win eight we'll or nine in out. the same division. Uh, before we go, we haven't, I haven't talked to you since they announced the official dates for the next two years of playoffs of the 212 teams. Do you like the way it's laid out or not? Yeah, for the health of college football, I do, because if they try to go up head to head with the NFL, it would absolutely eat them alive. And then they'd be looking at here in two or three years about well, maybe we shouldn't have been a 12 team playoff. Maybe we should shrink it back down size. The audience just isn't there. The audience is there. It's just you can't go head to head with the NFL. College football has tried that before and it doesn't work. And when those opportunities happen and here in the, in the near future, talk about a regular season, the NFL is going to start doing games on Black Friday going head to head with college football. That's going to be interesting to watch, but I like it. I know everybody complains about it. Well, these are midweek games. It's like, well, most bowl games are during the week and playoff games have usually been in that era area anyway with, you know, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And of course 
the Monday championship game. I saw a lot of people going, the national championship game on a Monday? It's like, where have you been? It's always been like that. What I think everybody's just trying to find things to complain about. The audience will be there because for the most part, they were able to avoid the NFL and people are going to consume college football no matter what. And just because it's on a weeknight doesn't mean it's going to really debilitate them. You're not asking everybody that's watching on television to travel to these sites. You're asking them to sit down in front of their TV at six o'clock, seven o'clock after a work day. All right. He is Brandon Marcello. You could do uh, a lot of things for us and uh, for Brandon. You can go follow him on Twitter. First of all, it'd be Marcello. Follow him on all social media and uh, watch his videos, support his work there at 24 seven sports. He's always great with his time with us. So uh, go support him as well at 24 seven sports. Brandon, we always appreciate it. Great talking with you as always. All right. See you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Take care. Brandon with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. (laughs) 